back, Ted. What do you say, boy? How are you doing? Oh, good to see you. Sure good to see you, too. Meet Captain Ted Lawson and Captain Dean Davenport of the Army Air Corps. You may have heard something about a little flight they made last year. They were pilot and co-pilot in one of those B-25s which took off from the deck of the Hornet and delivered a basket of eggs to Tojo. Sure great to see you, Captain Ted. Yeah, good, yeah. good to see you too, Dean. Say, did you ever get married when you came back here to the States? No, not me, Dad. <laughs> I thought you were in that hospital in China. You were always saying when you first got back to the States, you were going to get married first. No, I was in China, Ted. Things are a little different here. You're not fooling me, really are. I didn't think we'd ever make it. Say, remember yeah. that crash we had out there on the beach, then? That's no fooling. Oh, that was a little rough. Never heard so much noise in my life. Ah, really was. Well. It hasn't been so terribly long ago, though, really just a little over a year. 79 men and 16 planes on that ship, waiting for the moment to take off to Tokyo. Funny we weren't more nervous. It was almost as if we were going on regulation training flights. <laughs> Remember the day Doolittle tied that Jap medal on a bomb? The guy who sent it in said we should return it with interest. And we did. It was on our plane, wasn't it? I think so. Maybe it was a bomb that blew that uh, steel snower to smithereens. Ted, I still don't understand why our motors conked out on us after we left Tokyo. We checked and rechecked those planes every day. Well, those B-25s weren't made for the ocean, Dean. The salt in the air must have gotten our carburetor jet someplace along the line. Did you ever exercise with those Navy guys, Ted? You're darn right. And every time I ran around that flight deck, it seemed like it'd be too short for a pigeon to take off from. But Doolittle said it could be done, and he was right. Yeah, the morning of the takeoff, he looked like a man without a worry in the world. A great guy. I'll never forget that morning. April the 18th, 9.50 a.m., Saturday. We were still 400 miles away from where we were supposed to take off because that Jap patrol boat we ran into. The only rations we had time to put in the plane were a dozen candy bars and cigarettes. Remember what you said to me, Dean, as we sat in the plane? It looks like we got ourselves into a hell of a mess. And you said this is a hell of a time to think of a thing like that. Doolittle's plane went first. It all had been planned out on paper, but this was the first real test. The first time anyone tried to boost a land plane that size off the deck of a carrier. The extra load of gasoline and bombs didn't help either. I was pushing that plane in the air for all I was worth. Who was it? I sure had a bad case of the jitters when our turn came. Remember, I forgot to put down those flaps. Hell, it was my fault as much as yours. I should have checked. We were all jitters. That flight deck was short. The ocean was like a roller coaster. That's what counts. That's one trip I'll never forget, Ted. Nobody will forget it, Captain. And we won't forget the pilots on the raid who were captured by the Jap. And we aren't forgetting how some of them, we don't know how many, were murdered in cold blood. General Arnold, Chief of the Army Air Force, was given the answer for all of us. My message is to all personnel of the Army Air Force. In violation of every rule of military procedure and every concept of human decency, the Japanese have executed several of your brave comrades who took part in the first Tokyo raid. Those men died as heroes. We must not rest. We must redouble our efforts until the inhuman warlords who committed this crime have been utterly destroyed. See that young fella getting out of that bomber? Just an ordinary young American with a kind of ordinary American name. Levin. My Levin. Born in Brooklyn 26 years ago. They say he wasn't much at school, but he won the Navy Cross just the same. For bringing down a lot of Japanese planes and for sinking a couple of ships, too, with a guy named Kelly, Colin Kelly. This is the last time you're ever going to see Maya, because he's dead now, knocked out by the Japs. It's a good thing somebody had a voice recording set up out in the Pacific and asked him, what was your most exciting adventure, Maya? Well, I've been on about 50 bombing missions. I think my narrowest escape was when I was flying with Captain Colin B. Kelly in the Philippines. 
We just sunk the Haruna, and we're on our way back to our home base. We were attacked by two Japanese pursuit. They came up from below and behind us, got on our blind spot behind the tail, and stayed there. They were throwing everything they had at us. Cannon, armor piercing, tracer and incendiary bullets were pouring through the cabin. They set the ship on fire. When the control cables burned through, the pilot called over Interphone and told us to bail out. I got down to the escape hatch and found my navigator, Lieutenant Joe Bean, struggling with the door, trying to get out. Seems that the emergency release had frozen. Well, I realized we didn't have much time to waste, so I kicked the door open with one foot and kicked him out with the other. Then, well, I guess a man gets superhuman strength at times. I tore the door off the hinges and went out with it. Counted eight, pulled my rip cord. Good old shoot blossom. Well, that made me pretty happy for a minute. Picture changed, though, rather quick. It's too pursuit. Shot our plane down, set it on fire. Came around and started to strafe us. They made eight separate passes. Tracer bullets coming all around us. Look up at my chute, see them going through. See them going around my legs. One stream of tracers caught my right pant leg and ripped it up to the knee. Managed to get down okay. Guess I'm pretty lucky. I haven't been hit yet. This is the Army Navy Screen Magazine Cutting Room, where a combat film taken by Army, Navy, and Marine cameramen comes in from battlefronts all over the world. The Marine Staff Sergeant with the Expert Medal is 22-year-old Norman Hatch from Boston, Massachusetts. Sergeant Hatch went in with the first wave on the landing at Tarawa, armed with a pistol and a hand camera, and brought back a film record of the fighting on that island that looks as though it had been taken through a front-line gun sight. Let me see that second. You know, that's the best frame of combat film I've ever seen. Hey, that's okay. Well, an army man says that to a marine brother, he means it. Oh, just luck. You mean guts. Well, it didn't take any more guts than you fellows had when you went in on Kiska. Well, we had plenty of camera, plenty of film in Kiska, but we didn't have any chaps. <laughs> <laughs> How many cameras did you take in with you? Took in three ammo hand cameras. Scoot Lurko got his camera wet the first day. Yeah, that left us with two cameras, uh, Kelly's and mine. We took in about 5,000 feet of film. I only shot at 2,000. Only 2,000? Well, that's all. I picked my shots. <laughs> Did you shoot much film on the uh, ship? Well, I've got a cut reel over here. Do you want to see it? Yeah. yeah I like I, it. All I, I don't know is what I've seen in the newsreel. We shot some stuff on the way over, and the Navy boys shot some stuff on the wagon. This is a shot of the task force underway. I was trying to save film but it was my first big job and there were a couple of pictures I had to take. On the last day out, Father Francis Kelly celebrated Mass. Twenty-four hours later, a lot of those fellows were dead. A Navy steward baked a cake and the frosting got a big laugh, but the warning didn't seem so funny when we hit the beach on the next day. Every Marine in the outfit, including the cameraman, it was much about the operation as his CO. We were going out to take Basio Island, key to an atoll called Tarawa, a move that would drive the Japs out of that part of the Pacific up into their bases in the Marshalls a couple of hundred miles north. D-Day was the 20th of November. The naval bombardment began at 0500. There weren't any Jap airplanes around, but there's a Jap sub out there that the boys kept on the move. 
One thing I didn't want to take a picture of was a Jap torpedo heading for my boat. Our Army and Navy planes had been pacing the island for five days, and it didn't seem as though anyone on base show could have lived through that bombing. And we weren't green. I've served with the Marines for five years, and more than half of the task force were veterans of Guadalcanal. But we figured there wouldn't be many live Japs left on the island. Navy men on the wagons took these pictures of the loading of powder charges. I was slated to go in with the first wave, and we were waiting around with the Amtrak. Everybody got a kick out of watching the wagons unload on the target. Twenty-eight hundred tons of bombs and shells hit the beaches and cut through the pounds like a whipsaw. We packed shovels along with us, but we figured we wouldn't have to dig any foxholes, only Jap graves. There was a heavy smoke coming off the island, carried along by an easterly breeze. The Japs were still answering our fire when we headed in. The water was choppy. These pictures of the first wave of Amtrak were taken about a thousand yards from shore. We were heading straight in for the bloodiest operation in the history of the Marine Corps, but we still thought it was going to be a picnic. There's a gasoline dump going up. The air support was good. We kept about 100 planes in the sky all the time, blasting and scraping the Japs along the beach. Then the Higgins boat snagged on a reef, and the Japs began to get our range and the range of the Amtrak. We had to get out and wade about 400 yards to terrific crossfire. The sniper was fire empty when I got those shots. These shots were made a few minutes after the landing. The guys were hugging the beach, trying to get their wind after the 400-yard push. It wasn't going to be any 24-hour operation. There were plenty of Japs on the island, and they decided to die there. The Japs had spent every day and night for 15 months getting the island ready for a fight. The top of that blockhouse was about 15 feet wide. and rifle fire. And the Japs kept coming out, trying to knock out the machine gun. There's one of them. That sniper's got a beat on another. There's a squad of them. Boy, it was hot that day and was I sweating. the truth, but it doesn't give you any idea of how it smells, and the smell on that island was bad. The wounded started going back six minutes after we hit the beach, and the stretcher bearers, all members of the shore party, were the unsung heroes of Tarawa. Plenty of them got hit. Stretcher bearers loaded the wounded onto rubber rafts and pushed them out to the Higgins boats off the reef. 
That was the only way of getting them out. They couldn't load them on at the pier because of the snipers. We lost more than 1,000 Marines. More than 2,000 of our men were wounded. I'd served with the outfit for 15 months, and I knew a lot of them. On the third day, that Marine, the one without the helmet, was souvenir hunting when he found a couple of Japs in that foxhole. The Japs lost 5,700 men. Imperial Japanese Marines defending an island that wasn't two miles square. That gives you an idea of how important parallel was in their plan. It was the stiffest price they've ever paid and one of their greatest defeats. We call those two the brothers. We brought in a few Japanese prisoners for intelligence. No more than a couple of hundred. That sniper was nearly six feet tall. The prisoners had to be stripped to keep them from concealing weapons. And they'd hide a weapon anywhere. They were sullen and still hooked up over the idea that they were supermen, even after they'd been captured. The Koreans were different. They were men whose country had been captured by the Japanese, and the Japs brought them out to Tara to work as slaves. When we got back to Pearl Harbor, they told us that in Cairo, Roosevelt, Churchill, and Chiang Kai-shek had guaranteed Korea her independence on the same day that we saved these Koreans from the Japanese. I took these pictures the day before Thanksgiving. camera gives you a good idea of the kind of desolation the cracked brains in Berlin and Tokyo have wished on the world. The wrecked Jap equipment we found has been brought in from all over. China, Malaya, Burma, Manchukuo. They had that two by four island loaded down with the loot from every country they've overrun. They even dragged guns down from the old British fortress at Singapore. But none of it was much good to them after the second day of fighting with the guns knocked out and the gunners dead. There's a kitten I found in the tracks of a Jap tank. The smell of water brought her out. That's me giving her the water. The other cameraman took the picture. The men got around to taking freshwater baths on the third day, and boy, they needed them. PBs were already working on the two bomber strips on the island. And on the fourth day, Tarawa began to function as an advanced air base. Ensign Bill Kelly of Newcastle, Pennsylvania, brought the first plane in. Everybody got around to watch the flag go up. A lot of good guys from the outfit weren't there anymore. I'm glad I got these pictures, because when you remember the roaches you've been fighting and the things they represented, and when you saw the flag go up and remembered the freedoms that flag stood for, you knew you were in on a good thing.